here to welcome the former Chief Justice of the Orissa High Court, Justice S. Murlidhar, who has very kindly consented to deliver the second edition of the lecture. The subject of the talk on the modern day advocate, ethical challenges and professional duties is in many ways in keeping with the theme addressed by Justice Lalit last year. We're all very much looking forward to hearing the lecture. I now request Honorable Justice P.T. Asha to say a few words about Mr. K. Sarva Bowman. A very good morning to Justice Murlidhar, former Chief Justice, High Court of Orissa, my brother judges Anand, Swaminathan, Justice Kannan, Justice Chandru, uh, my seniors, Mr. M.S. Krishnan, Espat Sarthi, members of the bar, ladies and gentlemen. I have been asked to share my experience with Sri K. Sarvabhoman, our senior in whose name this series, lecture series has been instituted. Robert Frost had said, there are two kinds of teachers, the kind who fill you with quail shots that you cannot move, and the kind that just give you a little prod behind and you jump to the skies. Our senior Sri K. Sarvabhoman fell under the second category. He was a senior who never liked seeing juniors idling. The minute he sees a junior sitting idling, he would give them some work. I think all my, uh, the, his former C, uh, juniors will all agree with this. In fact, when I had joined, the very next day of my having joined the office, there was a client sitting. So he immediately asked me to take notes about that client's case. Now, being a raw junior, I did not know what I was supposed to ask the client. What is, what is it that I'm supposed to take down? But anyhow, you said, whatever it is, you take down the notes. And one of the juniors, my juniors, uh, Krishnan, Champu, Kichu, Champu, Ilana, Shekhar, Urwa, Yar, Modala, Varano, Amanta, Chole. That was what he said. And as usual, it was only my uh, senior late uh, Shekhar who was first inside the office. So, the, so, you know, I gave him the notes and then I actually watched how he was uh, interacting with the client. And with that, I really learned what is it that as a junior, I'm supposed to learn from a client. What is it that I should call out from a client during these discussions? And what was uh, really encouraging for me was the fact that first day in the office, he has entrusted this work to me. That was something which was really, I felt very happy. As a junior, I'm sure most of you, I'm told that nowadays, uh, raw juniors are not allowed to interact with clients uh, immediately. But we had the privilege of straight away starting to talk with clients. Now, another quality which Bhuman sir had was the way he communicated with people. He had a beautiful line of communication with his feeder advocate, with his clients. Now, every day when we get, got back from the office, sir used to insist on all of us sending out letters for the that day's work. And the other... Uh, very peculiar trait of Bowman sir was he would come, all those letters would be there on the table. Var var he'll take out that letter. The one with envelopes would catch his eye. <laughs> so he would take that and he'll do like this. All the others will be relegated for the juniors to look at it uh, later on. And you know, he had, in fact, once he told why it is that he believes in this communication. He says, Ni letter da da. You know that advocate will remember you. So, you know, although he said it so jokingly, but it was a fact. Because you're constantly in the mind of your feeder advocate. Of course, today all of you all are on emails. We were not. We had these postcards and letters which we wrote. Now... Uh, on a personal note, when I joined the office, I was a staunch non-vegetarian. Now, the first day when I, uh, in fact, uh, I should also tell you all where I joined the office of uh, Sarva Woman Associates. It was near the tree near Ambedkar statue where Mr. Krishnan decided to take me into the office. So from there, I went to the chambers and then Bhuman sir asked me about myself, what I am, what all that. And the minute he came to know about my food habits, the first thing he told me was, 
If you want to have your non-vegetarian, you can bring it to the chambers. But don't bring it to the office because the house is also part of the office. So don't bring it there. And now this, I thought, was a great gesture coming from a person who is a staunch, I mean, who's a conservative Tambran. So that was one beautiful quality of his. Then another thing is we used to have these conversations. Sir used to come before all the others would come, before my other seniors would come. I would be chatting with him. So once when I was just drawn to the thing, I asked him, sir, what is the advice you would give for a junior? How do I do to make myself better in the profession? What he told me was, watch the judge and read the brief. He said, however much you might read the brief and you know the facts, if you don't understand the body language of the judge, then you're lost. And this is an advice which since I, I have a lot of youngsters sitting here, this is an advice I think uh, most of you should note because nowadays I notice that most juniors, I don't mean to be critical, most juniors don't watch the judge. They are just there to make their arguments, quote, unquote, arguments. So this, is, this was another thing that I had uh, learned and this was a, a, a mantra that I had very scrupulously followed. I had always had my eye on the judge while I was making. The minute I knew that I was not, the point was not appealing to the judge, I would go to my plan B. Now, Bowman sir was basically a very, very easygoing person. I mean, he never intimidated anyone. We could be at ease with him. And after he had, uh, I think Justice Subramanya has something else to say. <laughs> um, after he had stopped coming to the court, I used to make it a habit to go and visit him and have a chat with him. And he would love to hear all the corridor talks, what is the latest gossip. So, you know, that was the kind of relationship I had with uh, Mr. Sarvo Bowman and, and uh, a very nice human being. We are all fortunate to have been his uh, juniors. I thank you for patiently listening to me. I request Mr. M.S. Krishnan to welcome Justice S. Murlida. Judges, retired judges, senior advocates, and my dear friends, it's my privilege and pleasure to be interested with the task of introducing Justice Murlida. Justice Murlidhar, in his role as a judge, requires no introduction. And all of you know him better than what I can tell you. But I am going to talk about not Justice Murlidhar, but Murli. And uh, to be more precise, white and white and Murli. <laughs> and his mother, Mrs. Raja Lakshmi, was a member of a bhajan group which used to take place in our house the practice sessions as well as uh, the learning and all that. So my mother and she were good family friends and I knew Murlidhar when we were very young. We used to bump into each other, but uh, the real acquaintance came when I was, in, when I was doing law. Murlidhar and Vasu, I am sure he must be here, who is son of uh, the revered uh, Sri Vardachari, they were running a team called Kanchi Cricket Club. Now, I, we, we also, the practice sessions used to take place in the ground off Greenways Road, where today we have the judges' bungalows. And, uh, well, uh, as youngsters, all of us except Murlidhar, will come with multicolored uh, flannels and uh, shoes and all that, some of some without shoes, etc. But here you will see Justice Murli there in white, sparkling white, starting from his cap to his shoe. I mean, for I mean, it's not just uh, on a day when there is a match. He used to be like that for every practice session. You must be wondering why I am speaking all this here. It is that dedication and sincerity to whatever he does. It could be a matter of, you know, schoolboy cricket or college boys cricket. But that was the spark in him, which really 
you know was at, at that point of time we were not really conscious about that but today you think about how he developed it, it, it anything that he did likewise and when uh, he wanted to he did his uh, graduation in chemistry subject to correction and he also got admission into law and uh, regional engineering course uh, on the on the engineering side so many of us advised him that for his hard work and uh, sincerity the law legal profession will, would be the best profession and ultimately he took law and here we know where he is another aspect of uh, justice murli dharan is in, in the meanwhile he also cleared his acs in first shot all the three groups so he was by the time he completed his law he was also uh, qualified to be a company secretary then he joined the chambers of uh, justice uh, no, i'll come come to that a little later but i have another important uh, anecdote which i thought i should we all he was also selected he was a good cricketer he was selected for the law college and uh, he was the vice captain of the law college cricket team so we had a tour and i always felt that there was a a wide gap between the bat and his pad while he while batting and of course as a true lawyer he never accepted that so when we went on a tour to bangalore we were confronted with a very powerful cricket team each of them really i mean we, they were just short of ranji standard and uh, it was and they smashed us all around to, to they scored about 250 runs and we thought we are doomed and uh, basu and murli i think they either they opened or they got together in the uh, after the first wicket fell this i mean and i frankly we never expected both of them to they they scored a, they had a century partnership more than 150 and we won the match and just guess what he said after he came back i don't know whether he remembers it no was there a back gap between the pad and the bat today <laughs> so i said you might have scored the lot today but the, definitely the gap is still there <laughs> so so that, that we we can never forget those days that uh, and then as a lawyer he joined uh, mr p s narsimhan and thereafter was in private employment for some time and then went and joined mr g ramaswamy a doyen of our bar and i am given to understand that uh, he made himself indispensable to mr g ramaswamy when he was practicing in the supreme court and uh, and possibly it's an experience which he gained there which has stood by him right through and uh, he used to burn the midnight oil and brief mr g ram sami after he wakes up at possibly 8:30 correct but and uh, he, he used to instruct him so well and normally the weak point for senior counsels are questions of fact I mean, they don't have the time nor the inclination to read the entire bundle. So you need a junior like Murli who reads everything to tell you what the facts are or the facts that are to be highlighted. And uh, I, I personally heard uh, Mr. G. Ramaswamy praise Justice Murli Murli there uh, uh, and the efforts that he used to put in. So I am not going to talk about what he did as a judge because all of you know better. so i will now leave the field for justice murli dev and uh, <laughs> now request mr espart sir p to honor justice murli dev a very warm good morning to everyone speaking in front of friends is makes me a bit nervous <laughs> they know so much about me actually i must thank uh, ms krishna for being kind to me in the introduction <laughs> i don't want to name everyone in the audience because everyone is known there is a galaxy of uh, sitting past judges senior lawyers friends relatives so it's really an honor to be asked to deliver the 
second K Sarva Woman Memory Lecture. The lecture series was inaugurated as Suryasika was mentioning, 5th April last year, with an oration by the former Chief Justice of India, Justice Yu Yu Lalit. That is indeed a hard act to follow. Shri Sarva Woman was just 24 years old when he enrolled as a lawyer in Madras in 1953. He joined the chambers of Shri K.S. Ramamurthy, a leading appellate side lawyer of those times. Shri Ramamurthy himself had a formidable professional pedigree, having devilled in the chambers of Shri K. Rajayayar, a former Advocate General of Madras, whose brother K. Srinivasan was a doyen of the tax bar. After Shri Ramurthy joined the bench of the High Court, Shri Sarva Bowman and another junior of Shri Ramurthy, Shri T. R. Mani, formed a partnership which was perhaps the busiest and most sought after appellate side offices in the Madras High Court. They were perhaps the best in the business, not just in Chennai, but arguably among the best in the country. When I enrolled as a lawyer in Chennai in September 1984, I had several occasions to drop in to meet my good friends and cricketing buddies, Kichu and Champu, in those chambers. Champu, for those who don't know, is Parthasarthi who just <laughs> felicitated me. That is where I also met Ram, just as Rama Subramaniam, for the first time. Although I was confined in my early days of practice to the city civil courts, I took advantage of them being the same campus as the High Court and would invariably spend the afternoons watching the best of the bar display their forensic skills. I vividly recall being struck by Sri Sarovoman's calm and collected self while presenting his arguments, which undoubtedly had a persuasive effect not just on the judges to whom they were addressed, but even on a bystander like me. I also recall how the presentation styles of Sri Sarovoman and Sri Mani were a study in contrast and yet effective in his own way. I still recall the envy I felt knowing how fortunate Champu, Kichiv and Ramasubram were in learning their first steps under two veritable masters of the civil side. Not only have the three of them done the chambers proud, with Ram becoming a Supreme Court judge and the other two being designated as senior lawyers, but the chamber has produced two High Court judges, Justice, late Justice K. Sampath and Justice P. T. Asha, and three more serious, A.K. Kumaraswamy, Mukund, and P. Valliyapan. The next generation, Sri Sarvabhoman's grandchildren, Surit and Surasika, Kichu's own son and daughter-in-law, are also doing well to keep the flag flying high. And I find a collection of uh, other juniors of the Sarvabhoman chambers, who I'm sure will keep that flag flying high. Perhaps the choice of today's topic is befitting the occasion. Sri Sarvabhoman was a stickler for ethics, and commanded great respect both at the bar and among the bench. I must now explain the scheme of today's talk. I begin briefly sketching the history of the legal profession in India before talking about the legal and statutory regime governing the legal profession. I then explore the scope of the functions of the Bar Council of India and the state bar councils. And for the non-lawyers in this audience, you'll be shocked to know what lawyers can do. <laughs> While touching upon the rules framed by the Bar Council of India, including the recent rules concerning the admission of foreign law firms into specific areas of practice. In the next part, I examine the current status of the profession. I note the cutting edge areas of law practice, the impact of technology, including artificial intelligence. And I talk of the new and emerging areas and avenues for lawyers to explore. I then ask who the modern day lawyer really is. In the final part of my talk, I focus on the ethical issues and challenges confronting the legal profession and the questions that we should be addressing. We have writings on lawyers from the time of the Greek civilization. A quote attributed to Socrates reads, the orator does not teach juries and other bodies about right and wrong, he merely persuades them. And I'll also be referring to the writings of Cicero. In Madras, the vakils predate the Supreme Court that was first established by the East India Company in 1801. Soon came the barristers. In his book, Famous judges and lawyers in Madras, Suresh Balakrishna has this to say. In the days of the British rule in India, 
there were a set of practitioners called barristers, another called attorneys, and another called vakil. There were also pleaders and advocates. The distinction between barristers and attorneys is similar to the distinction between the barrister and solicitor in England. Traditionally, the barrister argued matters in court, while the solicitor met with the client, did the groundwork, instructed the barrister. In India, the class of practitioners called vakils were the indigenous lawyers. Since they were neither barristers nor attorneys, in due course of time, they began to enjoy the privileges of both. The barristers were not happy that the attorneys are allowed to appear on the appellate side. The attorneys were not happy that the barristers were better paid and dominated the original side. Both were unhappy that the vakil had unlimited privileges, both on the original and the appellate side. The vakils were unhappy that the barristers dominated the profession, that they were all complaining about and petitioning against each other for rights and preservation of the status orally was the running theme of those days. The Law Commission of India, in its 266th report on the Advocates Act notes, the dawn of the legal profession in our country could be seen in the Indian High Courts Act of 1861, commonly known as the Charter Act. This authorized the establishment of high courts under the letters patent, and those letter patent empowered the high court to make rules for enrollment of advocates and attorneys, who were also known as solicitors. In the early days, three acts, namely the Legal Practitioners Act 1879, the Bombay Pleaders Act 1920, and the Indian Bar Councils Act of 1926 were there to relate to the legal practitioners who were then in the courts. With the dawn of independence, of course, we had the Constitution of India. Article 145, sub-article 1, enabled the Supreme Court of India to frame rules as regards those who could practice before it. For instance, the advocates on record are unique to the Supreme Court of India. But there is no corresponding provision granting similar powers to the high courts. Only the parliament under Article 246 read with Entry 78 of List 1 of the 7th Schedule could make a law with respect to the right to practice before a high court. It was not until 1961, following the recommendations from the All India Bar Committee and the report of the 14th Law Commission that was presided over by M.C. Settlewad, the first Attorney General, that the Advocates Act was enacted in 1961. This statute amalgamates, codifies, consolidates the law relating to the regulation of practice by advocates and the system of the legal profession. It is a regulatory law which establishes the Bar Council of India, which is the apex body, and the state bar councils. In exercise of its rulemaking power, granted to it under Section 49 of the Advocates Act, the Bar Council of India has made rules. Part 6, Chapter 1, is titled Restrictions on Senior Advocates, and Chapter 2 is titled Standards of Professional Conduct and Etiquettes. The preamble to this chapter reads, and all of this could be sounding very strange to those who have actually encountered advocates. An advocate shall at all times comport himself in a manner befitting his status as an officer of the court, a privileged member of the community, and a gentleman bearing in mind that what may be lawful and moral for a person who is not a member of the bar or for a member of the bar in his non-professional capacity may still be improper for an advocate. Without prejudice to the generality of the foregoing obligation, an advocate shall fearlessly uphold the interests of his client and in his conduct conform to the rules here and after mentioned, both in letter and in spirit. The rules here and after mentioned contain canons of conduct and etiquette adopted as general guides, yet the specific mention thereof shall not be construed as a denial of the existence of others equally imperative, though not specifically mentioned. I'm sure this is all complete jargon, Greek and Latin to the non-lawyers in this room. And conveniently, the advocates can claim that they don't understand a word of this. The rules are subcategorized to indicate duty to the court, duty to the client, duty to the opponent, duty to colleagues. Note that the pronoun, pronoun in the entire preamble I just read out is masculine. Incidentally, the Bar Council of India has at present 18 members. If you go on the website, you'll find the snapshots of all of them. And five officers, not one is a woman. It has had 31 chairpersons, including the present incumbent. Again, not one has been a woman. If you go to the website of the Bar Council of India, or for that matter, the 
website of the Bar Council of Tamil Nadu in Puducherry, you will find no information on the number of lawyers. Forget even a breakup in terms of gender, age, nothing. You don't find any information on the number of disposed of and pending complaints. The list of law universities and law colleges that have been recognized by the Bar Council of India. The term of the present Bar Council of India, I think this must be some kind of a record. that This body has not gone in for elections for over a decade now. The status of elections to the various bodies in the Bar Council of India and the state Bar Councils and so on. It is only through an answer given in Parliament on 10th August 2023 by the Union Law Minister to a question that one is able to learn that there are around 20.13 lakh enrolled advocates in the country, of which Tamil Nadu's share is around 1.14 lakhs, and this too is not updated, and I'll explain why in a short while. In reply to another question on 2nd February 2023, the minister informed the Rajya Sabha that as on 31st January 2023, as per the data for 15 states, this is only a data for 15 states, they don't have the data for the, all the states and union territories, Provided by the Bar Council of India, there are 2,84,507 women lawyers enrolled out of a total of 15,42,855 advocates, according, accounting for 15.31%. The numbers in the different categories, and these are the categories of lawyers we have in the country today, advocates, senior advocates, solicitors, both Bombay and Calcutta still follow a system, follow a system of solicitors and uh, advocates. Advocates on record, that information is not available on the website of the Bar Council of India. If you contrast this with the websites of the Law Society of United Kingdom, the American Bar Association, you'll notice how they give you granular information on gender, ethnicity, age, and so on. So this is a serious absence of information about lawyers in the country. It is by now acknowledged in the judicial pronouncements of the High Court and the Supreme Court that the regulatory function of the Bar Council of India has been an utter failure. The model of peer review has simply not worked. To the lay audience, you must explain that if you have a complaint about a conduct of a lawyer, let's say the lawyer has taken money from a client, promised to file a case and does not file the case, has uh, shared information, has, shared, uh, has failed to share information about the case, and any kind of misconduct that you may think of, you can go to the Bar Council of the State with a complaint against the lawyer saying that he has violated the Code of Ethics that is now codified. It's part of the Bar Council of India rules, which has therefore got a statutory character. The Bar Council doesn't take action. A provision says that for one year, if the State Bar Council does nothing, it can be transferred to the Bar Council of India. It is possible that the Bar Council of India also does nothing. But this is the status today that many clients get fed up in pursuing complaints with the State Bar Council or the Bar Council of India. And when such complaints do get taken up, they get taken up by a committee comprising lawyers themselves. So this is so called the so-called peer review. And it's come for a lot of criticism because of the lack of integrity of this peer review committee itself. And the punishments handed out are far too lenient to make any serious impact on the conduct of lawyers. So this is a serious shortcoming in the Advocates Act and has been commented upon adversely by both the High Courts and the Supreme Court. The statistics regarding pending and disposed of disciplinary proceedings against lawyers is not available in the public domain. I would request, uh, it is only through a response filed in a pending case in the Supreme Court that we learn that as far as the Bar Council of Tamil Nadu and Puducherry is concerned, the position is asunder. Out of 176 cases, you will find in two cases there has been a reprimand. In 12 cases, there has been a suspension and a removal from the roles of the Bar Council in just one. So you can imagine how ineffective it is. And this information itself doesn't tell you how long it took to dispose of that complaint? What was the result of that complaint? Nothing. So you really get to know very little about what the bar councils are doing as regards these complaints they receive. And we don't know how often they sit. And there are enough tales of the members of these committees hearing these complaints themselves being influenced by one or more person before the, who is facing the charges. Unlike perhaps other countries, the Bar Council of India is also tasked with regulating law universities, colleges that offer law degrees, which 
function and this also has come in for severe criticism. Right now in the country, there are two main types of law courses in vogue. The three-year LLB course following a three-year graduate degree and a five-year course after high school. The standard of all these law schools is certainly not uniform. You have, for instance, the national law schools. Almost every state today has a national law school. And uh, there's a common law entrance test admission test, CLAT, through which many of them enter the stream. And there's a gradation of these uh, national law universities. There are ones that are most sought, sought after and some which are not so very well sought after. So again, when you look at the national law schools, there is no uniform standard. And when you move on to the non-national law schools, again, the standard varies quite sharply. There are factors like those that have passed out from national law schools and those who have not, those who have studied English medium courses in school and college and those that have not. All of this contributes to the wide disparity in the overall proficiency, skill, confidence, exposure and aptitude of the fresh law graduate. This is the modern day young lawyer that we are concerned about. Of course, we are also going to be talking about the modern day senior lawyer. This wide disparity in standards of the law schools in India explains why, for some law graduates, passing the All India Bar Entrance Exam, an exercise conducted now by the Bar Council of India for the last 10 years, is a cakewalk, whereas for some others it isn't. But even this is viewed by many as not serving the purpose of filtering out the non-serious practitioners. For those who may not be aware, when you compare this to... I think you can switch on the light. When you compare this to what happens in the United States, there you have to write a separate exam for each state. For instance, if you have a license to practice in New York, it does not entitle you to uh, practice, let's say, in California and vice versa. And these standards are very rigorous. Entering the bar in the United States itself is a big, big exercise. Likewise, in England, those society examples, uh, the exams con conducted by the Law Society are difficult. Of course, the barristers' exams are a different story altogether. What I'm trying to say is there are standards which have to be met, minimum standards that have to be met by lawyers abroad. And the standards we lay out for a fresh law graduate to in enter the bar are not very high. The advocate and record exam is reasonably difficult, not again very difficult, and does help in some way to ensure that the more serious lawyers are the ones actually filing cases in the Supreme Court. That too has come in for a lot of criticism. We have advocates who merely lend their signatures and don't actually participate in the preparation of the case. That also has uh, come in for critical examination in the Supreme Court. So, for, so far, what we have seen the, is that the bar today, as it was at, at the time of independence, is largely male dominated. Nevertheless, the gradual increase in the percentage of women lawyers, visibly more in the major metropolises, and the recent increased presence of the persons with special abilities and different sexual orientation is certainly an encouraging sign. I, I don't know if many of you followed in the news. For the first time, the Karnataka High Court, uh, a lawyer with a hearing impairment, was permitted to argue with a sign language instructor standing by her side. And it was a very welcome sign. We have lawyers who are visually challenged appearing in our courts, whether in Delhi or in Orissa, I'm sure in Madras too, who are doing reasonably well. So slowly we're seeing the entrance uh, of uh, the entry of uh, lawyers with different abilities coming into our courts. Today's world, because we're talking of the modern day lawyer. The world in which lawyers at the time of Indian independence practiced has undoubtedly gone, undergone transformation on several fronts. With those changes have come the challenges too. The modern day advocate, as is every other individual, is today inhabiting a markedly different world. The Human Development Report of 2022, which is titled Uncertain Times, Unsettled Lives, notes that there has been a perceptible drop, drop in the Human Development Index world over for the past few years. And the reasons that they found this is happening is the increasing distress across global populations. This is related to planetary changes, associated inequalities, 
political polarizations, and new industrial transitions. Artificial intelligence, genomic editing, digital development have also been changing fundamental aspects of human existence. And these technological changes outpace human ability to grasp their social implications. The Human Development Report further noted that collective violence, which includes political violence, is generally a cause for increased mental distress, particularly among transgenders and non-binary youth. The report also highlights the growing inequality in society and continued gender disparity in areas of education, employment, and participation in politics. India's HDI rank in, 19, in 2021 was 131 out of 191 countries. On 10th March 2023, after a long debate on whether lawyers from countries abroad should be allowed to practice in this country, there's been a lot of debate on that, a lot of resistance from the bar here. It went through an entire process of consultations. And in March 2023, the Bar Council of India has notified the Bar Council of India rules for registration and regulation of foreign lawyers and foreign law firms in India. In the objects and reasons to these rules, the Bar Council of India quotes Justice Krishnayar, who in his judgment in Bar Council of Maharashtra versus Dhabolkar noted, and I'm quoting, law is not a trade and briefs no merchandise. So the leaven of commercial competition or procurement should not vulgarize the legal profession. The Bar Council of India then proceeds to note that the legal profession in India has to rise to the occasion to meet the global changes in the legal arena caused by migration of people from one country to another on such a large scale that had not been witnessed in earlier days. This is what the Bar Council of India says. The world is becoming a global village. International trade and commerce is advancing at a great pace. The demand for an open, responsive, and receptive legal professional dispensation mechanism in India from clients and the public who operate in international and cross-country business is becoming severe day by day. Growth in international legal work sphere and globalization of legal practice and internationalization of the law is increasingly becoming relevant to the growth of the legal profession and practices in India. So the Bar Council of India hopes that these rules will enable foreign lawyers and foreign law firms to practice foreign law and diverse international law and international arbitration matters in India on the principles of reciprocity in a well-defined, regulated, and controlled manner. Now I turn to the legal profession, and here I'm going to take the liberty of sharing a few funny anecdotes with all of you. The modern-day Indian lawyer, it seems, can be an international lawyer. In fact, there has been a growing trend of Indian lawyers, both senior and non-senior lawyers, becoming door tenants in a barrister's chamber in London, appearing before the International Court of Justice. I'm sure many of you have uh, watched or even heard of Mr. Harish Salvi representing India in the Kulbushan Jadav case, which was argued at length. And they also appear in other tribunals, apart from themselves being arbitrators in uh, the tribunals like the uh, International Chambers of Commerce, the, CIA, the uh, Singapore International Arbitral Center, and so on. Justice Madan Lokur, after his retirement as a judge of the Supreme Court of India, sat on the bench of the Fiji Supreme Court. And I think his term there has just come to an end. They've also been appearing before the adjudicatory mechanisms in the World Trade Organization. The modern day lawyer, particularly after the COVID pandemic, is able to appear before a multitude of tribunals across a wide range of geographical locations in virtual mode carry his entire office on a tablet like this, keep abreast of all the latest developments in the law at the click of a mouse or the tap of a finger on a digital screen. The Indian lawyer today can aspire to have a global audience. Some of them, in fact, do. You'll be uh, uh, happy to note that the live streaming of the proceedings of the Supreme Court of India, let's say on the same-sex marriage, was watched by a wide range of people across the world. So they see the lawyers in action, they see the judges, and uh, it's increasing the transparency of these proceedings. It's more, it should be welcomed by all of us. And uh, this is a, clearly a change that has happened in the last decade. 
but this is not truly representative of sample of the indian bar as a whole far from it in fact many a court in the remote corners of india and the lawyers practicing in those courts remain untouched by the march of development or technology there the resource and the digital divide is real so while in the horissa high court i did take forward the whole scheme of digitization of records opening of virtual courts facilitating appearance by lawyers through video uh, conferencing chambers which we installed in every district court there are still many a lawyer in the country who cannot afford even a you know a smartphone leave alone a laptop or a tablet so for many of them they really feel left out by this digitization process and it's a challenge to bring them into this fold i'm just going to play one clip i should just explain the context in which i'm playing it this is a film called all rise for your honor made by a filmmaker called sumit khanna who's not a lawyer he literally went around the courts in the country not the so much the high courts but the district courts and how ordinary citizens interact with the legal system so his entire film has got six segments in one segment he's telling us the travails of a old elderly woman whose son is required to sign an affidavit for her to file in the court where there's a property dispute the son happens to be in jail so the lawyer is advising her what uh, should be done to get this affidavit attested it's only the attestation of an affidavit of a person who is in a jail in varanasi so what they have to go through just for that one exercise is what this clip is about i think we can play it now very familiar scene for many of us ye ek affidavit chal ke agar sign karwa de jail mein jana hai unke pita hai unka bar unki ticket tayar hai ye aage lagaya hai ye lagaya hai ye ticket lagaya hai ha ye mukti ka ticket aana hota hai jira pun jayenge 
the stamps never ending rajar mohan hai sab film mein aayega kitna kharch hi sab kaam hota hai acche acche okay pure ab isme yahan yahan to banne hai isme to kuch nahi banna hai You know, we used to play this film. Switch off the lights. <coughs> for a fresh batch of judicial officers in the Judicial Academy, National Judicial Academy, for many years. 
just to give them an idea of how their own court premises functions. And it's very important for a judge to be conscious of this. This chaos you see is a very daily affair for many of us as lawyers who've gone to the trial courts and have also come to the high courts. In many of the high courts, you'll find a large hall of lawyers sitting across desks. And uh, basically, there's a lot of chaos. The entire thing is quite disorganized. So this adds to the stresses in our functioning. And uh, one attempt that I made in Orissa was to declutter the court space, not just in the high court, but in the district courts as well. And we've not paid enough attention to the absolute you know, squalor that uh, they function within. And uh, this is happening on a daily basis. And sure, the many the audience who are not lawyers may have encountered these experiences. I myself was asked to register a will by an old friend of my father's in Delhi. And I was a lawyer of not even you know 10 years standing. And I thought it's a fairly simple task. I looked up some conveyancing books. I drafted the will. And uh, I took it to the sub registrar's office. Believe me. I went four occasions and I just couldn't get the will registered. I shared this experience with another lawyer of mine in the Supreme Court. He says, why are you breaking your head? Don't you see some lawyers sitting outside the sub registrar's office? I said, yes. He said, just give it to him. Give him his fee. It will get done in no time. And he was absolutely right. So these are specialized areas of practice, which many of us are completely unaware of. Like P.S. Narsimhan, with whom I worked, was essentially a convincing lawyer expert at drawing up sale deeds, powers of attorney, whether general or special. And that's a skill in itself. Then getting it registered is a skill in itself. These people know which is the right court fee, uh, stamp duty, stamp to be uh, you know, engrossed on it, all of that. And if you as a litigating lawyer try and get into this field, you'll be completely at sea. Law is literally an ocean. There are many people doing many things. So I continue, across the landscapes of India, if you look close enough, you will find the Indias of the 19th, the 20th, and the 21st centuries managing to coexist, impervious to the ravages of time. So too in the legal profession. And with the continue some of the practices in the name of what lawyers will tell you, sir, this is the tradition of our court. So that word tradition becomes very important. Thus, you might find that references for the death of a member of a local bar association or even of a senior clerk in that uh, bar in the remotest of courts might take place at 11 a.m. in the morning and the court may cease to function for the rest of the day. Innumerable festivals, farewells, welcomes, there's no shortage of these, means that time comes to a standstill. Everything else, including justice, can wait. And then the strikes by lawyers called by various names like abstention, boycott, and so on. These lawyers, too, are modern-day lawyers. How has this endured despite the advancement of the human race, greater exposure to the best practices, and remarkable developments in the law? Dr. Madhav Menon wrote this article sometime in September 2012 in The Hindu, and he says this. Being a private monopoly, the profession is organized like a pyramid in which the top 20% command 80% of the paying work. The middle 30% manage to survive by catering to the needs of the middle classes and government litigation, while the bottom 50% of lawyers barely survive with legal aid cases and cases managed through undesirable and exploitative methods. In fact, uh, you know, one of my areas of specialization and my PhD was on that was legal aid for the, uh, in the criminal justice system. So whenever I spoke to any body of lawyers on legal aid, invariably there'll be one question saying, sir, but what about legal aid for lawyers? So many lawyers actually are surviving hand to mouth in many of these courts, like the courts we saw now, and barely able to make ends meet. Given the poor quality of legal education in the majority of the so-called law colleges, over a thousand of them working in small towns and panchayats without infrastructure and competent faculty, what happened with uncontrolled expansion was the overcrowding of ill-equipped lawyers in the bottom 50% of the profession fighting for a piece of the cake. In the process, being too numerous, the middle and the bottom segments got elected to professional bodies, which controlled the management of the entire profession. In fact, you will find this comment often made that all these people who get elected as president, secretary of bar associations actually have very little work. 
in the courts. The so-called leaders of the profession who have abundant work, limited money, respect and influence did not bother to look into what was happening to the profession and allowed it to go its way of inefficiency, strikes, boycotts and public ridicule. This is a tragedy of the Indian bar today, which had otherwise a noble tradition of being in the forefront of the freedom struggle and maintaining the rule of law. Indeed, it is this very bar that saw, saw, saw the likes of Mahatma Gandhi. In fact, the younger uh, lot in the audience should know there is a wonderful book by Charles de Salvo called The Man Before the Mahatma, which explains the uh, years, the 20 years in South Africa that Gandhiji spent as a lawyer, first as a barrister and then as an attorney in uh, uh, Johannesburg. Mahatma Gandhi, you had Dr. Ambedkar, Sardar Patel, Motilal Nehru. There's a funny anecdote about uh, the Allahabad bar. One of the young lawyers walks into the Allahabad bar, not knowing whether he should actually pursue litigation or not. He asks one of the elderly lawyers there, sir, what are the prospects? So he says in one line, Vakalat ban gai to Motilal, nahi bani to Jawaharlal. We had Rajendra Prasad, those who are not aware, the Champaran movement. <laughs> if your uh, practice picks up, you will, can become a Motilal Nehru. If it does not, you will become a Jawaharlal Nehru. <laughs> we had the likes of Rajendra Prasad. Rajendra Prasad, should be aware, assisted Gandhiji in the Champaran movement. So there was a young brand of, uh, band of lawyers from Patna who helped him in that. C.R. Das, you've all heard of, uh, P. Prakasham, Rajaji, Madhusudan Das in Orissa, Bulaba Desai. I mean, numerous, it's a galaxy of uh, lawyers that we've had in the freedom struggle who participated in full measure. The general image of the lawyer, however, is a negative one, as it is of the courts, plagued by delays, uncertainties, and unrecoverable costs. The number of instances of misbehavior by lawyers in courts with clients does not seem to abate with the passage of time. So I have this wonderful book called Lowering the Bar by Mark Galanter. Mark Galanter is a law professor in Wisconsin in the US, a great lover of India, and since the early, late 60s started visiting India. And one of his areas of study was the legal profession in India. So he has brought out this book of jokes about lawyers. And one of the jokes he says is, a father was asked by his little son, what is a lawyer? Well, my son, says the father, the lawyer is a man who gets two men to strip for a fight and then runs off with their clothes. <laughs> Lawyers are known to browbeat courts, demand an audience, demand orders. And this doesn't stop with just the uh, lawyers in the courts like the ones we saw. It happens at the high court. Thankfully, not so much in the Supreme Court. But there is this tendency, particularly if you're a bar leader, if you happen to be the president of the local bar association, secretary of the local bar association, or you're a member of the Bar Council of India, you walk into a court, you think you have the right to ask for an order. So one such person was V.C. Mishra, who happened to be the chairman of the Bar Council of India on two separate occasions. V.C. Mishra's case went up to the Supreme Court. He appeared before a single judge of the Halabad High Court, berated him, started using expletives. So the poor man had to write to the Chief Justice of India, saying this is what is happening in my court. Will you take action for contempt of court against V.C. Mishra, which the Supreme Court did? They actually uh, cancelled his license to practice. That was by a bench of three judges. That law was reviewed later by a judge of bench of five judges in the Supreme Court Bar Association case. And they said since the Advocates Act governs the licensing of lawyers, even the Supreme Court of India cannot cancel a lawyer's license to practice. At most, it can take action against him for contempt of court. So this was the law laid down by the Supreme Court. Lawyers can resort to unruly behavior with little provocation. The astonishing incidents that happened in the Madras High Court in 2015 led the High Court ordering the CISF, the Central Interstitial Security Force, to take over the security management of the entire campus and eventually made rules 14A to 14D allowing the High Court to debar a lawyer whom it found guilty of contempt, debarring such lawyer from practice. Now this, of course, change in the rules brought about its own set of criticisms by lawyers. But in a response to that criticism, 
Mr. Prabhakaran, who's even now the vice chairman of the Bar Council of India, wrote an article in the Hindu and where he criticizes the authors of that article. He says the authors have very conveniently forgotten that when rallies and processions were taken out inside court halls obstructing the proceedings, when courts were boycotted for all and sundry reasons in violation of the law laid down by the Supreme Court and Harish Uppal, I'll just show you what that is, when two instances of murder of very notorious lawyers inside the Egmore court complex took place on the eve of elections to the bar associations, I think Justice Chandru was asked to give a report on the happenings in the Egmore court and what can be done to set right that uh, whole uh, system. When a lady litigant who came to the family court in Chennai was physically assaulted by a group of lawyers who also coerced the police to register a complaint against the victim. When a group of lawyers barged into the chamber of a magistrate in Puducherry, wrongfully confined him till he released a lawyer on his own bond in a criminal complaint of sexual assault filed by a lady. When a group of lawyers garrowed a magistrate for not granting bail and one of them spat on his face, leading to a strong protest with the Association of Judicial Officers. And when very recently, a lady litigant was physically assaulted by a group of lawyers for sitting in the chair intended for lawyers inside the court hall, lawyers such as the authors of the article under the, uh, you know, uh, maintained stoic silence. So what basically is trying to say is there are so many incidents of misconduct and unruly behavior by lawyers, but the senior bar just keeps quiet and does very little about it. The rules were challenged in R. Muthukrishnan versus Registrar General of the High Court of Madras and was struck down by the Supreme Court of India, again, saying that when it comes to the disciplinary control of lawyers by cancelling their licenses to practice, it can't be done by the High Courts, but only under the statute uh, by the Bar Council of India itself. In defending these rules, the High Court told the Supreme Court that there have been incidences in all these incidents, which includes raising slogans and marching down the corridors of the court. This is when court proceedings are in progress. Using of handheld microphones to disrupt court proceedings. Attempting to, in some cases, successfully entering the chambers of puny judges of the Madurai bench of the High Court. Two instances of hoax bombs in the form of broken mechanical clocks being placed in the areas in the court to ensure disruptions. Now I'll just share with you what the Harish Uppal case says about strikes by lawyers. The Supreme Court says lawyers have no right to go on strike or give a call for boycott, not even a token strike. No bar council or bar association can permit calling of a meeting for the purposes of... All right. This is very important. It says all lawyers must boldly refuse to abide by any call for strike or boycott. No lawyer can be visited with any adverse consequences by the association or the council. And no threat or coercion of any nature, including that of expulsion, can be held out. I don't know how many of you have seen the film Jai Bhim. Okay, the central character of that film is shown crossing a barricade. He's sitting in the second row now here. He is one who defied a boycott call. He jumped over a barricade and said, come what may, I don't care about the Bar Association, I'm going to go and defend this case. But you have very few lawyers who are permitted to do that. Lawyers who do that can be actually assaulted. And it has happened. They can be you know, denied facilities in a Bar Association. I myself assisted Mr. G. Ramaswamy in appearing for Kiran Bedi. Kiran Bedi was the Deputy Commissioner of Police in Delhi in 1987, when there was a strike by lawyers and they were taking out a long procession. And uh, her premises, the office of the DCP, was part of the Thesisari complex itself. And I think when she had ordered a restriction on the movement of lawyers, they marched towards her office. And she felt threatened. She ordered a lathi charge. And uh, all hell broke loose. So a commission of inquiry was set up. And uh, two sitting judges of the High Court were that commission of inquiry, Justice Goswami and Justice Badwa. And uh, bar associations had passed a resolution saying no lawyer will represent Kiran Bedi. So she came to GR and said, this is the resolution by the bar. GR said, don't worry, I'll appear. GR loves appearing in a difficult case, loves taking on challenges. You should tell GR, sir, this is a difficult case. <laughs> in fact, he used to say, why do you need a senior if it is an easy case? You need senior in a difficult case. So I remember there was a resolution by the uh, Bar Association of Delhi High Court, not only barring Mr. Ramaswamy from using the facilities of the Delhi High Court, but all his juniors as well. 
and that it like after three or four years it was withdrawn just to complete that narration so this was under the commissions of inquiry act and kiran bedi was subject of the inquiry whether her conduct was justified so persons whose conduct are being is being inquired into can be questioned by the commission of inquiry but the question but the issue was when should they be questioned so this was the first sitting of the commission of inquiry and kiran bedi was in the court premises it was part of the high court itself the court hall and uh, the judges came and sat they talked to each other and immediately said is ms kiran bedi here and being kiran bedi she said yes my lords i am present here so they said please come we are going to examine you and this was not anticipated by any of us so there is mr ramaswamy sitting here i am sitting next to him and uh, there are other lawyers on both sides and she has to come from behind and walk in front of us and she was not prepared for this nor were we so she asked like this jr and he said muttered under his breath he said just keep quiet just keep quiet she gets up into the box and refuses to answer the questions of the judges so the judges got furious and they started dictating an order for contempt of court jr quietly waited till the order was finished and he said my lord now that your lords you have passed the order let me just examine it so the proceedings were adjourned for the day the minute we returned to the chamber he said slp draft pane so we got down to drafting the slp and the rest is history actually jr was able to establish before the supreme court that a person who subject matter of the inquiry has to be examined last after all the evidence is led against her it was a remarkable presence of mind of the man because there was no precedent for it it's that's a sheer learning and long years of experience that told him that something was drastically wrong about it of course i can speak on and on about my senior and what happened in the court but that for another lecture there's no time for that so despite the directions in harish upal there has been reluctance on the part of the bar council of india to incorporate them in its rules governing the conduct of advocates those directions are breached with impunity in its 266 report the law commission notes and this is about just tamil nadu that there are 220 working days in a year in the courts in the state during the period 2011 to 16 districts like kanchipuram were on strike for 687 days for that whole period 137 days per year kanyakumari 117 days per year madurai 115 days per year and i'm talking of the district courts kadalur 92 days per year shivaganga 81 days per year and these are all by strike calls by advocates and then if you read the 266 report the litany of misconduct is a large one and here i must uh, tell you one of the first on the top of the list is indulging in practices of corrupting the judiciary or offering bribe to the judge so mark galanter's book talks of two lawyers conversing about a case one lawyer says we have justice on our side what we want the other side is the chief justice <laughs> the other misconduct retaining money deposited with the advocate for decree for the decree holder even after the execution proceedings scandalizing the judges i must also share this with you i was a lawyer for the bhopal gas victims for many years there were 34 compensation determination tribunals set up in the bhopal city itself and uh, we wanted to make sure that the victims actually get the money so we said please show us the bank account that you've opened in your name they showed us we made sure it was a cross checked only in the name of the victim fine what we didn't realize is as soon as the account is opened the lawyer already had got blank check checks signed by the victim so the contingency fee arrangements that lawyers deploy in this country is quite uh, alarming although if you look at the bar council of india rules and one of the acts of misconduct is this entry into contingency fee arrangements when you have accident victim lawyers you have land acquisition lawyers you have these kind of lawyers where money is involved will invariably uh, take a cut take a part of the compensation amount as their fees scandalizing judges constant abstention from conducting of cases attesting forged affidavits failure to attend trial after accepting the brief taking money from the client in the name of the judge uh, this is a very common thing in fact many of us as judges sitting judges don't know how these things have been done out in the uh, you know uh, 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 in the area outside the courts 
indecent cross examination breach of trust conducting fraud fraud and forgery these have all been held to be serious misconduct with the lawyers being protected in their work that is the communication between the client and the lawyer is privileged under the law in the indian evidence act we have a specific provision that uh, uh, you know protects the lawyer from disclosing what the client confided and being the keeper of the client's intimate and business secrets for instance trade secrets are all disclosed to the lawyer if you're a patent attorney you're a trademark attorney you know the business uh, accounts and dealings of the client are all supposed to be kept very secret in fact they form what is called the confidentiality club because two business rivals are in court and they have to disclose to each other what their trademarks are or the patents are they enter into a confidentiality club agreement and uh, that's made part of the proceedings in the court so that that cannot be breached so you wonder with a lawyer having so many privileges why should they indulge in all these acts there are then brazen acts of rendering a mockery of court proceedings for instance buying off witnesses who can prove the case of the prosecution you will remember the case of rk anand senior lawyer and that was depicted in a film called jolly llb i don't know how many of you have seen that film it shows how a senior lawyer is trying to win over a witness uh, through bribery this is what the supreme court said and th there was another special public prosecutor who was assisting mr anand in doing this the conduct of the two appellants both of them lawyers of long standing and designated senior advocates should not be seen in isolation the bitter truth is that the facts of the case are a manifestation of the general erosion of the professional values among lawyers at all levels we find today lawyers indulging in practices that would have appalled their predecessors in the profession barely two or three decades ago leaving aside the many kinds of unethical practices indulged in by a section of lawyers we find that even highly successful lawyers seem to live by their own rules of conduct we have the instance like i mentioned kiran bedis of bar association passing resolutions saying that nobody from our bar association will represent this uh, accused and the supreme court has had to time and again say that this is completely Ill illegal this is what the supreme court says it is against the traditions of the bar which has always stood up for defending persons accused of a crime such a resolution is in fact a disgrace to the legal community but even today in the newspapers you will find regularly bar associations passing such resolutions then there are instances of lawyers not in fact having valid law degrees the bar council of india had to uh, make the bar council of india certificate and place of practice verification rules and this is what the law commission of india notes a very high percentage 33 to 45% of lawyers were fake such lawyers were practicing either with fake law degree or without a degree at all the process of verification is not yet complete and the so called bogus lawyers could be identified only by scrutiny the supreme court has in fact constituted a committee to oversee the verification process but nowhere near an end before you begin to wonder if every lawyer in the country fits the above description i must reassure you that is not true we have the likes of late kg kannabiran senior lawyer who practiced mainly in the high court at hyderabad and the trial courts defending the civil liberties and human rights of innumerable human rights workers and even those labeled as naxalites at great personal risk then there was balagopal then we've had justice tarkunde who returned to the bar justice rajinder sachar who after a stint as a judge returned to the ja uh, bar contributing a lot in this area uh, after a memorable stint on the bench indra jay singh flavia agnes are among those who have stood and fought for the justice not for the not just for the clients but have also been able to find their own space in the male dominated bar facing enormous resistance and braving prejudices both from the bar and the bench nandita haksar is another example of a human rights lawyer who has undertaken difficult cases in the northeast and elsewhere risking her personal safety chandru's commendable work in this area has been acknowledged by the resounding success of the film jai bhim these are the lawyers who have made a tangible difference to poor people's lives i can go on and on i don't know how many of you have heard of the jagdalpur legal aid group which had basically young women lawyers working among the tribals in chatisgarh and they had to face the hostility hostility of the local bar association in bastar in chatisgarh and then there was shahid who defended you remember the kasab case there were three accused he defended two of the accused who got acquitted 
he himself was assass assassinated. And there's a film made on his remarkable work, which is eponymous. It is titled Shahid. I would urge all of you. It's a film made by Hansel Mehta. I would urge all of you to view it. These lawyers are among many others who practice in poor people's courts, like magistrates' court, like beggars' courts, like juvenile justice boards, and so on. There are such lawyers at all levels of our courts who are doing pro bono work, both at a personal level and as a part of the Legal Services Committee. These lawyers could have a Mandela, a Gandhi, a Ruth Bader Ginsburg, or a Thurgood Marshall, or a Brian Steven Stevenson as their inspiration. Then there are PIL lawyers. There are genuine PIL lawyers who bring to the high courts and the Supreme Court Brandeis briefs. Those who are not aware, Brandeis brief is basically the kind of a petition that is prepared in great detail with facts, figures, with empirical studies being presented to a court so that the brief argues for itself. It's called the Brandeis brief. There are many such PIL lawyers doing that hard work and bringing genuine PILs before the court. They could be environmental lawyers. For every six or seven frivolous and meaningless PILs, there is at least one which is a genuine one which deserves serious attention. These lawyers may be unpopular, objects of derision and ridicule, but necessary in a noisy democracy such as ours. And there are low profile lawyers quietly working to protect rights and liberties. The contribution of these lawyers to the protection of our precious civil liberties should not be undermined by the unsavory acts of other lawyers whom I have been talking about. These lawyers who stand up and fight are not, not just the unfair system, but their own compatriots are an inspiration to many a young law student and lawyer. It is these lawyers that give us hope that they will make the system work for the people for whom it matters most. They may not be career lawyers, but those who view it as a rendering of public service. Some of them may be appointed by courts as amicus curiae to assist it on questions of law, yet they may be not earning much monetarily, but over a period of time earn enormous respect in civil society and definitely the bar. The fact is that the bar is big enough to accommodate all of them. So even if you go to the smallest of the bar associations and you ask them, sir, in this bar, who is a good cross-examiner? They will tell you. Who is a good civil lawyer? They will tell you. Who does not mislead the court? They will tell you. You see, these lawyers earn a name, earn a reputation. And these are the ones who stand out. They may not be the successful lawyers or the celebrity lawyers, but they quietly do their work. Also, many a lawyer who shares the above values need not be litigating. For instance, conveyancing lawyers, I spoke about them, who have perfected special skills at drafting agreements, deeds, and contracts, and so on. This is by no means an easy task. I've told about getting these documents registered, paying the current stamp duty is not an easy task. Then there could be those working in departments of government, drafting MOUs, statutes, rules, regulations, ordinances, the legislative department in any government. Then there are lawyers working with people who are teaching or guiding students, being part of social and mass movements, civil society organizations, lobbying the government for change in law and policy, following up with the administration for someone's denied pension, someone's missing family member, or a victim of police or state access. There are those litig like litigating or petitioning a human rights or a women's or a child rights commission and working within the system as paralegal workers. They could be even munshis in courts, you know, the ones who drop petitions. They still work. In, if you go to a co court in Baleshwar in uh, Orissa, if the lawyer has to file an application for interim injunction, he simply gives it to the stenotypist and says, you know, type out an order 39 petition or write it out. And it's still happening in our country. All of these people comprise a system. The choice of the modern day lawyer is actually getting wider. Justice Hidayatullah categorized lawyers into two broad types, the forward looking lawyers and the looking forward lawyers. <laughs> the latter are clear that lawyers a career. They say in five or 10 years, they must reach a goalpost set by then. BMW car, sir. Flat in, you know, uh, ECR, or in Delhi, it will be Gurugaon. And uh, these are the, and it could become, it could be becoming a senior partner, a partner in a top law firm, having your own law firm, becoming a judge or a senior lawyer, a Supreme Court arguing counsel or an AOR, becoming an advocate general or attorney general and so on. There's no end to ambition. President Lincoln would hold uh, public meetings in the White House. I'm talking of 1866, 1867. And many people would come asking for favors. And he would be sitting in that big room. And there was this one lawyer who said, you know, 
please consider me for a federal uh, judge appointment. And uh, Lincoln looked at him and he said, actually, there is no vacancy right now in this uh, federal judge's post anywhere. Then uh, two days later, this guy is walking on a bridge on the Potomac. When he sees somebody fall in and drown and die, when he rushes there and finds out that the person who drowned was a federal judge, <laughs> immediately he rushed to the White House and uh, said, Mr. Lincoln, I know there is a vacancy now. <laughs> this uh, judge has fallen. Winkle, Lincoln looked at him calmly. He said, I'm sorry to tell you that the lawyer who saw him file has already been, uh, fall has already been appointed. <laughs> They could emulate lawyers who can create litigation, continue it for generations. You know, there's one famous anecdote of uh, three generations of lawyers. That law office has a lot of bundles. And the senior lawyer on one particular day is called out to appear in some other court in some other city. So he tells his grandson, listen, just take care of this case if it comes up. And lo and behold, the case reaches. The case is heard. An order is passed. So this grandson, those days, sends a telegram to the senior lawyer. The telegram simply says, justice triumphs. Okay, And the grandfather, in panic, sends back saying, appeal at once. <laughs> <laughs> this, these kind of lawyers can promise to get a wrongdoer out of trouble, and perhaps in succeed in that endeavor with their credible skills. So you have a New Yorker uh, newspaper, which has a cartoon, where the lawyer matter-of-factly explains to the client, if you want justice, it is $100. Obstruction of justice runs a bit more. And they can promise salvation at a price. They have no qualms about charging contingency fee. So the client asks the lawyer, what's contingency? So the lawyer explains, if I lose, I get nothing. And if you win, you get nothing. <laughs> the lay person finds the entire legal system mystifying, the legal jargon incomprehensible. It becomes impossible to navigate it without the lawyer, who virtually works as a gatekeeper to the system. And I have a famous comparison with vadiyars, priests. So the regular day of a vadiyar is morning, you can do a punya vajanam, you can do a puja in somebody's house, you can do a you know, cremation. You can do a kalyanam. You know, in the course of a day, you can do so many things. And then senior vadiyas and junior vadiyas. Senior vadiyas is too busy to be everywhere. So junior vadiyas will do the preparatory work. The senior vadiyas will come and just appear. Only vadiyas know the language of the gods. You pay the vadiyar for ashtotram, he'll only speak for three minutes. If you pay him for laksharshana, he can reasonably speak for ten minutes. Look at the comparison with senior vadiyas. So you take a full tattoo of who, Param, and all that to the Sanadi, the Vadiyar will look at it and pick up three things and put to the Lord, right? Likewise, you brief the senior about 10 points, he'll probably argue only one or two. <laughs> so this whole system is actually mystifying to the lay person. And you could see that in that short clip. Look at the look on the people's faces. Judges sitting here will, you know, uh, appreciate this more. When we sit there on the dais and look, we can see the anxious look on the client's faces. They perhaps know the answers that we want, and the lawyer is unable to communicate. Some of us, of course, call the clients forward and ask, what is it? Another funny episode. The Punjab and High, Haryana High Court, the lawyers are on strike. So no work is happening. Judges have decided, we'll anyway sit in court. They're sitting in court. This elderly Sadaji, who's got his case, is sitting quietly in the rear. So the Chief Justice calls him forward. He says, Babuji, kya hai apka case? So the Sadaji in his broken language, of course Hindi and Punjabi mixed, tries explaining the case. So the judge says, Dekhe, aap vakil rakh lena, hume samaj nahi aara hai, aap chuk hai rahe hai. He says, kamal hai, samaj aapko nahi aara hai, aur mujhe vakil rakhna hai. Do you need a translation? So the judges are telling this old Sadaji, we are unable to understand what you are saying, you must probably engage a lawyer. He says, you guys are not able to understand, and why should I engage a lawyer? <laughs> These types 
of lawyers who are as old as the profession itself. And uh, this will continue to manifest and thrive throughout generations. I have no doubt about it. But the other type two will, the ones who are human rights defenders and working for the poor people, this depends on one's personal orientation beliefs, social, economic, and also political. And this need not remain static at any point in time. We have the sad spectacle of bar council and bar associations not protesting against attacks on human rights defenders, brazenly praising political masters, and all too ready to surrender their independence. You know this uh, belonging to a political party. So leader of political party is facing trial. You'll have some 50 lawyers in that courtroom shouting slogans. And this is not just unique to Tamil Nadu. Many places around the country. It may sound cliched, but it is important to reiterate that without a strong and independent bar that believes in the constitutional values of liberty, equality, fraternity, and dignity, you cannot expect the judiciary to, uh, you cannot expect a judiciary which will uphold these values. The ethics that lawyers wish judges to abide by must be practiced in the bar. A dishonest lawyer will not make an honest judge. The converse need not be true. An honest lawyer can easily be corrupted because judicial power can corrupt absolutely. There is a real difficulty in finding lawyers with judicial aptitude for appointment to the bench in the high courts. I can tell you out of personal experience. A, a, a lawyer with a lot of practice who's brilliant need not become a good judge. Because being a judge means sitting in one place from 10.30 to 4.30, developing patience to listen to arguments, and many of those arguments may not make sense, may be repetitive, and may be irritating because they don't, the lawyers don't come to the point, they don't tell you the facts. So this judicial aptitude means having a lot of patience, having composure, having you know, the uh, ability to sift relevant facts and irrelevant facts, and still function in your full faculties, and again, from 10.30 to 4.30. There is a real difficulty in finding lawyers with judicial aptitude. Equally, it is difficult to fill all the vacancies in the level of district judges in the, in the direct recruitment quota. For those who may not be aware, there are three levels at which people can enter the judiciary, and here I'm talking of the district judiciary. You have the uh, judicial services examination, where people enter, law graduates, sit for the examination, and enter the judicial service at the first level, munsifs, magistrates, and so on. There's an intermediate level, the district judge level, where with 10 years experience in the bar, you again sit for exams, you go through a process, and you're directly appointed at the district judge level. Third, of course, picking up from the bar to appoint to the high court uh, bench. And in the high court itself, it's a rough ratio of one third being what we call service judges, that they come in from promotion by the district judiciary, and the rest come from the bar. Now, that intermediate level of district judiciary, we're finding it very difficult in the high courts to actually find people who can pass the written exams and sit for the viva. Madan Lokur, Justice Madan Lokur shared this anecdote in Delhi with me, and uh, where even the basic questions were unable to be answered by many of these candidates. So he looked at the application of one of them, and it says references. It said Narendra Modi. <laughs> he says, uh, does Mr. Modi know you? He says, no, no. You said in your thing, uh, application, give names of two persons whom you know. <laughs> so Madan Lokur said, at this rate, you could even say President of India. He says, that my brother is saying he's waiting outside for the viva. <laughs> So we actually find that even basic questions are unable to be answered by some of these candidates, and then reflects poorly on what is happening in the bar. See, there is no bar academy. You need a continuous learning process, right? Unless there are so many cutting edge developments in the law, which lawyers are not aware, and uh, they need to be constantly upgrading their skills, and uh, also look at the best practices around the world. Actually, today lawyers have the advantage of watching live the proceedings in the UK Supreme Court, in the Canadian Supreme Court, in the Australian High Court, and so many Supreme Courts in the United States. You just go on the net, and all of you can also watch. You can watch how proceedings are conducted, how lawyers present their case, how judges conduct themselves. So it's actually a learning process, which is all there, available for you, if you want, if you're inclined to. Now, in the Orissa, my own experience as a Chief Justice told me that more women are entering that first level of the judiciary. And we may have a scenario in 10 years' time where at least 70% of the judges at the first level are women in this country. Yeah. And then the continuous learning program, only exception is Kerala, which has that 
continuous learning program, but other bar associations have not taken it very seriously. So who is the modern day lawyer? A bit or all of the above or none of the above? This much can definitely be said and with some degree of certainty. The lawyer in the 25 to 30 age group is probably a millennial, a product of a five-year law school, born in a mobile phone era, never written an inland letter, or gone to a post office. If born in an affluent or a middle-class family, is perhaps comfortable with and can afford smart devices, he's hooked onto social media. This lawyer is likely to have participated in moots, done one or more internships during the law course with judges and lawyers, is reasonably articulate and confident. This lawyer is confused about choices during campus placements. Do I join a corporate law firm or do I litigate? Do I go for an LLM if I can afford it or get a scholarship? Do I begin in the trial court or in the high court or in the Supreme Court? Basically, spoilt for choice. Not so if a first generation rural, small town, non-English speaking lawyer. If the lawyer is an LGBTQ+, or is differently abled, there is an additional disadvantage. For a young lawyer, however, the actual learning begins in the courts. You know, there is this incident of junior lawyers uh, who are asked to go and, you know, take an adjournment by the senior lawyer. Some of them are sent to the brief, some of them are not sent to the brief at all. So this young lawyer goes up to the court and says, your lordships may kindly pass away. <laughs> the judge is taken back. <laughs> He says, what are you saying? I mean, if I grant your request, my family will be very unhappy. <laughs> There's another lawyer who goes up to the court and says, please tell me what the time is. The judge looks back and says, it's 10.35. Why are you asking? He says, my senior instructed me, please go ask for time. <laughs> so even for young lawyers in navigating the system, it takes some time to understand you know, what actually happens in court. This modern day lawyer suffers from the general negative perception about the bar. The modern day lawyer is unlikely to find a house on rent. I must tell you own, my own personal experience. I found with great difficulty a house on rent in Delhi soon after my marriage. And uh, I told my, uh, I told Usha, listen, I have to tell him that I'm a lawyer. It had come through a broker because you know later on they find you're a lawyer, they can just throw you out. So I called up this landlord. He was one Mr. M.K. Dhar. And I said, Mr. Dhar, I find the house very fine and the rent is also OK. But I must tell you, I'm a lawyer. He said, don't worry, I'm in the IB. <laughs> <laughs> Lawyers are unlikely to get a loan or a credit card or even a partner who will understand. <laughs> okay. The areas in which the older generations of lawyers practiced still exist but generally are on the wane. Nevertheless, in the bar, you will find these lawyer types. The legacy lawyer, three or third generation, fourth generation lawyer, same chamber like what we saw today. The corporate lawyer, networking conference law hopper, the fraternal lawyer, same village, city, state, same law school, same university, same mother tongue. So again, GR. So GR will get so many calls. And he doesn't have time in the midst of his conference. So the phone will be given to him. The other person on the other side starts saying, GR, and the Ganapati Agra Aratla, GL say, come, 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 come. <laughs> phone <a> chacha. <laughs> Those connections that you have because of you know, where you come from and uh, which uh, village you come from, all of that matters. Then you have. Uh, claimant lawyer, respondent lawyer. You have landlord lawyer, you have tenant lawyer. You have husband lawyer, you have wife lawyer. In fact, it's only in the courts, a 70-year-old male lawyer will be saying, my husband actually ran off with another woman. <laughs> There's this adjournment lawyer, lawyers who specialize in adjournments. So again, a funny episode. So the two lawyers have an understanding. You know, if I agree to your adjournment request, you should agree to mine. This went on for some two years, three years. One day, this A lawyer asks B lawyer, says, please, today, you know, bear with me for this adjournment. B lawyer says, nothing doing. My client is standing right here. He'll skin me alive if I agree to this adjournment. And as they are speaking, the case is displayed on the board, so they have to enter the court. So A lawyer takes out his specs and smashes it, puts it back. 
and gets into the court and then is speaking out the briefs and reading with some difficulty when the judge says, Mr. Counsel, uh, your specs are broken and uh, you know, you're unable to read. He says, yes, my lords, but my learned friend will not understand. <laughs> So there are adjournment lawyers who will take adjournment notwithstanding, you know, the uh, situation. Then there's a TV panel lawyer <laughs> who appear on TV panels regularly. So there are so many lawyers. The modern day lawyer, however, has a greater range of areas of practice than early generation lawyers. International arbitration is passe. Apart from the courts, there is a plethora of tribunals, both domestic and international with heavy stakes, for instance, the Electricity Appellate Tribunal, the Telecom Tribunal. You will find the top-notch lawyers appearing there because the stakes are very high. There are cutting-edge areas of law practice, both in litigation and in transaction. You have bespoke drafting, you have online dispute resolution, you have legal process outsourcing, you have uh, negotiation, you have mediation. So the modern lawyer should be aware of terms like insourcing, offshoring, disruptive legal technologies, like automated document assembly, electronic legal marketplace, legal open outsourcing, big data, large learning models, and AI-based problem solving. I must share with you, this chat GPT has already got lawyers into trouble. There's one lawyer in the US who has now been debarred from practice because the chat GPT showed up a case law which doesn't exist. <laughs> the lawyer has to be aware of all the apps, he has to be ready to embrace e-filing, have an e-office, use AI tools, participate in virtual hearings, through, and be thorough with electronic evidence. Corporate lawyers have to know criminal law. Today, with the number of raids conducted by the ED and the CBI, the slapping of proceedings in the PMLA, like no other time in the Indian legal history, you're having corporate lawyers attend magistrate's courts. This is a reality. So top-notch corporate law firms have a specialized criminal uh, proceeding cell where they, on a daily basis, have to think of bail, anticipatory bail, and things like that. Nevertheless, the regular skills that lawyers have will still be required. The ability to read a lot, read well, read wide, and deep. You pick up a newspaper. You skip the, all the pages and go straight to the sports page. You get Times of India, you keep that aside. You say, show me Chennai Times. So it depends on where your interest is. And for a lawyer, you must be able to eat, uh, read difficult things. Lincoln, when he was a lawyer, would travel as a group. Lincoln, his opposing lawyer, the judge, and the judge's staff, they will all travel together from one town to the other in Illinois. Cases would be conducted in those villages and you know, small places. On the spare time, Lincoln would read anything that is given to him. It could be a book on geology. It could be a book on geometry. It could be a book on botany. The man was you know, absolutely voracious, you want to read something or the other. So that kind of interest you develop, if you read well and deep, your language improves. If your language improves, you're able to write better. If you write better, you will speak better. Without writing, speaking is very dangerous. <laughs> Simon Segel, the famous professor of law, was lecturing on courtroom procedure. When you're fighting a case, he said, if the facts on your si are on your side, hammer the facts. If you have the law on your side, hammer on the law. So one student asked, if you don't have the facts or the law, Segal said, in that case, hammer on the table. <laughs> Forensic skills, persuasion skills, negotiation skills are indispensable in the areas, any area of work that involves a lawyer. And there are numerous good examples around you to observe and emulate. You've heard of O.J. Simpson, right? He recently died. But he succeeded in the trial, he was acquitted. And uh, the lawyer who defended him was Johnny Cochran. So one of the onlookers is said to have commented, man, that Johnny Cochran is a smooth-talking lawyer. Even OJ thinks he's innocent. <laughs> what is happening in the trial courts, however, across the state, is lawyers are avoiding trials. They're focusing on bails. They're not actually prepared to cross-examine witnesses because that's a skill. That's a total skill. If they find that the witness for the prosecution is standing the ground, refusing to budge, they start taking adjournments and use that time to try and break down that witness. So this is a standard pattern we're watching. In Orissa, 80% of the work in the criminal courts is uh, in the civil courts, I mean, sorry, in the district courts is criminal work. 
So in order to encourage lawyers in the group of 30 to 40 to take up trials, the Orissa High Court, both in the years 2021 and 2022, floated what is called the Lawyer of the Year Award, where we set down parameters. And one of the parameters was that a lawyer should have conducted an entire trial by herself or himself. And it was successful. We found 19 lawyers in the first year, 22 lawyers in the second year. And I think we should make that extra effort to encourage young lawyers to actually conduct trials. Uh, I think I've already uh, you know, cro crossed my time. I just wanted to uh, flag some ethical issues. The Indian lawyer is seldom hauled up for negligence or bad advice or for sharp practices for misleading litigants in courts and for running other businesses. Actually, lawyers run a taxi business. Our landlords are actually uh, own farms. And many of them treat the profession as something in addition to what they're otherwise doing. And this has also affected the quality of the bar in, all across the country. The lawyer is exempt from the consumer protection law. Courts rarely hand down civil, severe punishments to errant lawyers. On the contrary, there are always those judges in every court who are keen to be on the right side of lawyers. Despite several studies and reports, very little has been done to strengthen the legal regime to regulate the work of lawyers. India is perhaps the only country where the litigant pays for the advocate's welfare by having to buy and affix a welfare stamp on every vakalatnam. I don't know if you're aware of this. You have an advocate's welfare act. There's a welfare stamp. In some states, it's not just 10 rupees. It's senior advocate's welfare. It's clerk's welfare. So all these stamps add, add to some 100 rupees. And we have very high uh, uh, you know, uh, enrollment fees for young lawyers. So very often, I'm asked, and I come to that. Somebody will ask you, how can you possibly defend this person? When Otto Shankar's appeal came before the Supreme Court of India, I was appearing for the Supreme Court Legal Services Committee. And I was very often asked, how can you be a lawyer for such a person? The answer is the one I gave then. While defending persons on death row, our duty as lawyers is to place whatever that person can place before the court. Every person has a right of defense, a right to silence, and a right to access to justice. No one can be condemned unheard. Further, truth is always stranger than fiction. With the emerging reality of wrongful and mistaken convictions, particularly in cases involving severe sentences, I am convinced that we need a competent criminal bar that will render professional services to every person in need of it. You do hear of proxy persons stepping in to rescue the main culprit, right? You have a system, a, a, a concept of what is called grave and sudden provocation. Only a lawyer can bring out these aspects. It's different from murder if it's done at a grave provocation. So the finer aspects of you know, how to uh, describe an event, how to analyze the evidence, how to argue on a sentence. You have a severe sentence. You have two sentences in, uh, in the case of murder, which is life sentence, death sentence. Much depends on the lawyer's skill and ability to make sure that death sentence is not awarded and it's commuted to life sentence. Just like a cardiologist will not refuse to treat a person incarcerated for murder, the lawyer should not refuse to defend a person accused or even convicted of a crime. Leave that to the judge to decide. You do your professional duty. In that process, don't twist facts. Don't mislead. Don't suppress or conceal a relevant fact. Don't leave your client in a worse situation. Important, don't crib about the system of which you are part. Be the change you want to see in it. Set yourself as the better alternative. Don't subscribe to this the system is broken down, sir. It's a useless system, sir. You're part of the system. There are too many people out there waiting for their day in the court, waiting for justice. Again, don't lose touch with reality and keep alive your common sense. Remember what Cicero, the Roman orator and lawyer said. The effective advocate remembers that men decide far more problems by heat or love or lust or rage or sorrow or joy or hope or fear or illusion or some other inward emotion than by reality or authority or any legal standard or judicial precedent or statute. Many an argument is won in the court by cool and calm reason and not rhetoric or anger. Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the famous Supreme Court judge, was arguing a gender discrimination case before a three-judge panel. 
one of the judges commented but mrs ginberg ginsberg women have equal opportunities now even in the military she responded not entirely your honor the air force doesn't provide flight training for women we are talking of the 60s the judge remarked oh my dear don't tell me women aren't in flight the women in my life have been in the air for years and so there was laughter in the court ruth bader ginsburg had to calm herself she says my mother's advice never lose my temper served me well instead of calling him sexist i said indeed your honor and many of the men i know don't have their feet planted on the ground <laughs> the biggest challenge for the modern day lawyer is to regain the trust of the lay person and to keep it the distrust runs so deep that a client is wary of walking to a lawyer's chamber with a full purse knowing that he will not be able to leave without being relieved of its contents so one more funny incident the prisoner charged with embezzlement appeared in the court without counsel the judge asks how does it happen you have no lawyer so the prisoner says well i did engage an attorney but as soon as he found out that i had not stolen the 10000 dollars he'd have nothing to do with me a woman was narrating to her friend when we got a divorce we divided everything we had equally between us two children stayed with me two went with my ex husband what happened to the property asked her friend that was shared equally between his lawyer and mine said the woman <laughs> there is much to be desired even of law lawyers and law officers representing the state nani palkewala in a letter dated 11 december 1981 89 congratulate swarab ji on becoming the attorney general and in that letter, letter he says the greatest glory of the attorney general is not to win cases for the government but to ensure justice is done to the people he noted in the united states the motto of the justice department carved into the rotunda of the attorney general's office reads the united states wins its case whenever justice is done to one of its citizens in courts In a letter dated 27th April 1988 addressed to Shri Parasaran Palkawala states and I'm quoting I always like to have you as the opponent because you will state the case as high as it can be possibly put but at the same time never try to take an unfair and unjust advantage of the other side I wish other government counsel would follow your laudable example today to expect a law officer to be absolutely fair in the court or you know to place the correct fa- uh, position is expecting a lot <laughs> i should mention to you about uh, ujwal nikam who was a famous public prosecutor in the uh, 26th november attack in bombay he actually said in 2015 that when he went before the television cameras while the trial was on and said that kasab had de- demanded mutton biryani he had done that to deliberately swing the public opinion against kasab he said on that particular day kasab was very emotional and he was looking down trodden i didn't want the public to develop any sympathy so in 2015 he was brazen enough to tell before cameras that all that i said about kasab demanding mutton biryani was a lie but this was much after kasab had been executed but this is the quality of public prosecutors that we have who are prepared to twist facts just to able to win public opinion in their favor and a parting shot let me uh, this is for the younger lawyers fali nariman identifies what are the qualities of a good lawyer in his autobiography before memory fades these are the qualities being honest and responsible in giving an opinion to the client about the chances of success in the case something you will never find most people will say sir or chance eduthukla <laughs> being acquainted at all times with the relevant law including case law on the subject at hand being clear and precise in court being extremely well prepared both on facts and in law before proceeding to argue a case and knowing that it is always better to understate a case than to overstate it apposite to the kind of lawyer that she sarvabhoman was she nariman says never exaggerate in court about the facts of your case or the applicable law avoid rhetoric and don't be too smart and for heaven's sake avoid being funny you will be stigmatized either as being impertinent or flippant in fact till you have established your reputation as a sound lawyer never indulge in pleasantries in court and this is what is most important and please never trump the judge's jokes or make it appear that you are more humorous than he is 
if you must tell a story tell one against yourself and i'm going to end with this there was a lawyer called john strange and he was planning his funeral with his wife which was what it's not unusual to do that abroad and he said on my grave the headstone should read here lies an honest lawyer the wife expressed surprise that he did not want his name to be set out on the headstone it will not be needed he responded for those who pass and read the inscri inscription they will invariably remark that's strange <laughs> thank you very much yeah, if any of you have any questions for uh, justice murlidhar he said he's happy to answer them i for your own predilections never pass an order in anger see this is an advice i got from my senior judge just as mukul mudgal with whom i sat first he said the minute you pass an order in anger even it may be the right result the order will read wrong it will not be a reasoned order it will get set aside in 5 minutes so when you the lawyer is irritating you no end either take a sip of glass of water calm yourself down get up from the dais go into the chamber or say we'll keep it at the end of the board better still we'll take it up tomorrow day after so that moment where you feel intense anger or irritation don't pass an order all right this is very important for this health is very important physical and mental most judges will agree with me you start getting back aches you can start getting ulcers because there are a lot of negative emotions that you encounter in court and invariably one person leaves your court unhappy the losing party is always unhappy ye judge ko kuch nahi aata hai right the, this judge doesn't understand anything so this is very common that uh, one person is going to go away saying that you know the system doesn't work this judge is not good so you must be aware of that you still have to do your duty sometimes both are unhappy why the case was not taken up so you were not aware of your capacity you are able to deal with 40 cases a day of those 40 you can do about 10 or 15 complete 10 or 15 that is if you are very efficient why list 60 cases knowing fully well that you can't take more than 40 you might argue sir it's not my choice the chief justice fixes the roster and he gives so many cases on my board that board management is very important because if you don't know which case is going to take long suppose the third case is going on for 40 minutes by the time the 20th case comes it's already 4 o'clock so you should estimate this estimate you can only do through sheer experience and by some lawyers some lawyers who get up you know that arguments can't be brief at all so you can tell them i'll take it call it later in the day so something like that that board management has to be kept uh, and be aware of all the lawyers tactics i should share with raju is here so my own senior difficult case he'll come a bit in advance and he'll sit in the third row in the eye shot of the judge okay the judge is addressing the lawyer explaining some proposition to him my senior will nod so from the corner of the guy his eye the judge has noticed the gr is agreeing with him gr is a leader of the bar so by the time the case is already gr is established connect when i was sitting in the courts in delhi or in orissa or in punjab when i noticed that in the third row there's a senior lawyer nodding his head i knew what was happening <laughs> lawyers will easily play on emotions okay there was this judge in the supreme court i won't take names and this lawyer who was arguing a preventive detention case and the first judgment was 1982 calcutta some page 346 so the judge is very happy because that's the judgment he wrote <laughs> then my lord 1988 calcutta by the time the judge has gone to division bench in calcutta again his own judge he says mr counsel remarkable what good research you have done you are showing me all the judgments that i had myself forgotten so without batting an eyelid the judge the counsel tells the judge before my lord i cite only my lord's judgments so be wary how you can get easily manipulated into you know reaffirming yourself without the lawyer telling you this judgment has actually been overturned or being adversely commented upon so judicial vanity is something that we should be very aware of and don't fall a trap to judicial vanity i can go on and on i think this is enough for the day <laughs> yeah 
Yes. Do you think the system is right now, particularly when reports are getting misled or misrepresented by lawyers, to avoid costs of No, no. So it, it will never work in our country. It doesn't work in our country. So the problem is, uh, in uh, heavy stakes matters, I think costs should be imposed. But in the run of the matters, it will be a futile exercise. Also, the caseload is very heavy, and there are mistakes that are likely to be made. But uh, this costs regime is something that we haven't worked on enough. At least, I think, when the clients are cor corporate clients, or they wasted the time of the court or misled the court, I think there must be heavy costs imposed. And only then you can deter sharp practices Even in courts. I have one question. Uh, you have had uh, memorable tenures in Delhi, Punjab, and Haryana, and Odisha, which we find, which we know from the fables you got. Which would you say is one of your most memorable experiences in any of these? Uh, I, Punjab and Haryana was mostly during the COVID time, and so we didn't sit in court that often. But there have been many memorable uh, moments, both in Delhi and in, in Orissa. Uh, in Delhi, one memorable moment, I talked about it earlier also, a young couple seeking protection from their respective parents. So we had actually got the couple into our chambers. And uh, when we found, we interacted with the parents on both sides, and we found that it would not actually be safe for this couple to even go out, leaving the court through the main entrance. So we actually arranged for the SHO to bring the police van to the rear of the court to the judge's entrance and facilitated the departure from the rear entrance. So this is something as judges we have to you know, strategically do because uh, honor killing is a, you know, a, a reality in India today. And in Orissa, it's a funny episode when it said Lord Jagannath versus Lord Jagannath. So I told the court master, there's obviously some error in the cost title. How can it be Lord Jagannath versus Lord Jagannath? It turns out it is Lord Jagannath Puri versus Lord Jagannath Anugul. There are two Lord Jagannath temples, and temples have properties. So they were contesting on whom the property belongs to. In Orissa, very often a petition will be filed for evicting Lord Jagannath from the property. Lord Jagannath will petition the court saying, please evict my Bhakt from the property. So these are funny moments in the Orissa High Court, which is peculiar to that court. But Lord Jagannath just own large amounts of property all over the world. And they're finding it difficult to actually collate all the information about all the properties. So it's a great uh, experience being a judge. You get a 360 degree view of the entire system. And uh, there's no end to learning. So I found it very rewarding. Thank you.